Revelation chapter 3, and the letter to the church at Sardis. I know the church at Sardis. You knew all of these churches, as we have emphasized and as we are emphasized or focusing on uh, during this meeting. that Jesus knows the churches. He's evaluating, he's assessing. Under the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are, over, that are ready to die. I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Mm. Now, the contents of this letter are weighty, aren't they? Yes, they are. Serious. Those of us uh, who are tender about the truth and receive this love of the truth, well, that opens your eyes. Whoa, I don't, want, I don't want to be a part of a group where that could be said about them. Not at all. There is very little. Well, we know in, the, in this group of seven letters, five of them have uh, negative things. Only, only two of them have positive things. Percentage-wise, this letter is just about like that. <laughs> the vast majority of the letter is negative. Only a small portion here at the end. Yeah. Only a small portion at the end is commendatory you might say. Uh, any other close to a positive thing is something from the past. Remember what you, remember therefore how thou hast received. Of course, that had to do with something he, he had done. Not what they had done. So there really wasn't very much here. These folks, in a sense, were hanging on by a thread. Now, it was a little more, a little more, a little, uh, you might say, a little sturdier, a little heavier thread than Laodicea, but not much, not much. This was serious business. I know thy works. A name that thou livest and art dead. Dead. You get the impression these folks were not paying attention. Be watchful. They were not paying attention. Something had happened here while they were busy doing something else. Huh? Remember one of the Lord's parables? Yeah. Or not, wasn't a parable. That, this was, it, it, was, it was a parable that uh, uh, one of the prophets told Ahab, wasn't it? About a king assigning someone to watch a prisoner of war, and while he was busy with something else, the prisoner escaped? Yeah. It looks like that's what's happened in this congregation. While they were busy with something else, the truth. And their heart wandered away or, or escaped to something else. Yeah. yeah. Turned to something else. And now they need this assessment by the Lord himself. And it's a, it's a sobering thing. It's a staggering thing to think Jesus, there, there'd be a, a church that Jesus would need to say such things to. Now, there are many... Christians who think, particularly here in America and this generation, that they are able to rightly evaluate or assess the church, at least their congregations. Uh, the, America has countless authorities, don't they? Who do such things? They spread their judgments widely through the media and they advocate uh, their helps and ideas for a price. 
It's for a price. In the early years, though, the brother, brother Paul stated this. Of course, under the authority of the chief shepherd, he said this. Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Right. See, that was, that was his uh, uh, prescription, you might say, for stability mm -hmm. and for strength, Amen. for sanctification. That was a prescription, to remain stable and faithful. Sardis had not done that. Hey, your years before, in fact, at the end of our Savior's ministry, earthly ministry, in his high priestly prayer, he said this about his disciples. He was praying for them primarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Amen. Thy word is truth. Amen. And so the power of this sanctification and the work of the Spirit then guided these eyewitnesses to report to us the things that we have believed. Amen. Things that would save and nourish and stabilize and strengthen the believers. Amen. Amen. That's what we've been granted. That's what we received. Remember, the Lord mentions, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hold fast. Mm -hmm. well, this is what we're talking about. This is these, these texts that I just that I just read here, cited for you. Paul wrote these words to the believers in Ephesus, the given is referred uh, to their gatherings, to their assembly, and to their strength, their early strength. And so here's some of the words that he wrote to them, that you are built, you are now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreign, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone Amen. in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God Amen. through the Spirit. Amen. Not, not for their own reputation. Amen. Not for solving people's problems, but for a habitation. Of, for God himself, he's done these things. For God himself, Sardis has lost sight of this. See, they, they apparently had it at one time. And it's slipped away while they were busy with something else, perhaps. Because they still had a reputation, didn't they? Yeah. They were busy doing something. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. To those who are busy doing something. And these primary things slip away. You got to pay attention. See, yeah, that's right. you got to pay attention. So this, so this. Be watchful. Be watchful, and keep things strong. Lest this, lest this occur. So Jesus began this. Jesus Himself, of course, is the builder of the church. I will build my church, He said, and He continues to do this. To work. The work that we're giving attention to now in this table in the wilderness. We're giving attention to building with him, working with him, putting our hands together for the same work. Here's, a, here's some of the words where we're familiar with these words that the Apostle Paul stated to leaders from the church in Ephesus. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Amen. This, is the, this is the process of feeding, feeding, feeding is a process Amen. to uh, remember, to be stable, to be strong then. Yes. We're called into this fellowship of this work. The church belongs to him. He continues to shepherd it to its appointed place of nourishment and refreshment and strength. So let's give some more attention to these words then. I know 
he says, essentially, I know the true you to the church in Sardis. I know what you're really like. Now there's a sense in which we would be pleased to hear that about us from the Lord if we are what we appear to be. The situation with them was they were not what they appeared to be. They appeared to be one thing, they were really another. And that was a serious matter. You see, in redemption, our Savior purifies the believing heart. He cleanses it by faith. He transforms that believer to the point where the prophet Ezekiel called it a new heart. Yeah. He contrasted it flesh and stone. The, the distinction here. It's a work that God does. It's not something that's managed by a person, by people, by an organization or institution. It's what God himself does. He, uh, uh, it's not some prescribed pattern of behavior contrasted with past failures of some kind, you know, where you've changed habits, changed patterns of behavior. Not, that's not what this is. God does a work over which Jesus, or in which Jesus is administering God's will and God's purpose, working in the Spirit, who is, is a primary instrument of this, transforming the believer by the operation of God. It's a continuing thing. It begins at one point and it continues. So this is, this is the impact of God's power by the gospel, raising one from the dead and instilling in that believer that which is life indeed. Yeah. It's such a, a stark contrast that the Apostle Paul describes it as new man, new man. compared to old man. Renewed in the image of him who created him. So the John says this about what, the, what Brother Paul called the new creation. He said, little children, let no man deceive you. He's having to say this because some have been deceived and there are deceivers out there, see. Yeah. So let no man deceive you. That means you've got to pay attention. Yeah. You've got to give attention to these things. Yeah. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Amen. You know them by, your fruit, by their fruits. Amen. See? He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Isn't it amazing that one of the apostles would have to say that? The person who does, who, who has a godly life is godly. And the person who doesn't have a godly life is not godly. That's what he's saying. It's stunning. In the first generation of the gospel. That has to be said. This is, this is how, how the... Uh, the kind of inroads that the enemy made, yeah, that's right. even in that first generation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now he said that same thing in several different, about three different ways there, didn't he? Nailing that down. So you'll understand. So you'll not be deceived about these things. Now, the, apparently these believers in Sardis have forgotten this. Yeah. They've lost their way somehow. We're not told how. doesn't matter how. They are told how to recover. <laughs> and they better get to it. Yeah. They better get to it. So, in John's words here, this is the reality of those who walk in the Spirit. They partake of God's divine nature. They seek things above. And so they increase in the things that God works in him. They indeed are free from the penalty and the power of sin. And they demonstrate it in their lives. Such people demonstrate it. The brethren in Sardis are not doing that. And this is serious business. So we have a record of the early believers being pure in heart, all they said and did until, well, it just wasn't very long, was it, before Satan found something in someone. Yeah. And the account of this begins with, but 
a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Brother Given just mentioned this was common. Was going on. We don't know how extensive it was, but apparently it was fairly common among these believers at the beginning. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter then, right on the spot, made an assessment. He made a judgment, didn't he? Yes, he did. Of that deed. Well, not just the deed, because the deed looked exemplary. My goodness. All of us have heard or seen instances like this where someone came and did something and everyone knew and saw. Well, you thought you did anyway, didn't you? Apparently, everyone in the room thought they were for, for a few minutes anyway. They thought, oh, wonderful. Here's some more. No, it wasn't some more, was it? This was something different. And so the Spirit of God and Brother Peter led him to say, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine own heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You know everybody in that room stopped breathing for a few seconds. Those were serious words. And it got more serious, didn't it? Ananias stopped breathing. Filled your heart to lie to the Holy, Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land. And then he gives this. He tells what's really happened. While it remained your own, it was yours. It was yours to give, to withhold. It was yours. No one. It was yours. Thou hast not lied unto men but unto God, and no one lies to God. You can't do that. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Then everybody really stopped breathing for a little bit. Ananias didn't breathe again. God's judgment was administered to the, through the Apostle Peter and Jesus' judgment here of the churches. In particular, this church is being administered through Brother John. Now, he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, unmasking those supposed believers who called themselves the church at Sardis. The church at Sardis. But they were not what Jesus makes of his body. They were powerless. We've already mentioned that this morning, haven't we? Powerless. A form without power. Because they had a reputation. Others knew about them, talked about them, were aware of them. We don't know the kind of things that were said. We can only imagine. We know things that are said about groups in our generation who are doing certain things, don't we? This is not an easy assessment, these kinds of things, especially in our generation, because of the media, uh, forms of communication, and so forth. We, we have some amazing forms of communication right here in this room, don't we? There are, there are brethren watching us in other parts of this country, perhaps in other parts of the world. It's an amazing thing. And so uh, it, those things, you know, while we appreciate them and are grateful for the tools, uh, still it, it, it makes, it, uh, it makes it, uh, difficult to make an assessment in some sense. We're not the only ones that are in the media, are we? Not at all. We're not even big boys. Some would say we're hardly a period in the sentence compared to the really, really big ones that, you know, they advertise themselves satellites all over the place and so forth, you know. And there's not just one. There's numerous ones like this. And it sure looks like something. I mean, the whole world. This, for some of us who have traveled overseas and preached overseas, this, this was my constant concern about being overseas. Were they coming to hear and listening just because I'm an American? Just because I come from you know where. 
and they think that we've really got it made. We've got all the answers, and, and, and if we, if we uh, Brother Gibbon was talking about reports and so forth, we've heard reports from overseas of all kinds of decisions made for Christ. Well, I hope so. Or was it a response to the American who was preaching? For all kinds of reasons. I hope so. Even here in this generation, and this is probably what we would call the second generation by now. By, by the time this letter was written, probably, yeah. you know, we're into the second generation and, and the Savior's having to say some really harsh and weighty things, mostly negative to these congregations. Five out of seven. Three of them no good, or two of them no good thing. And two of them only good things, and the other three are mixed in there. Harsh things. I know your incomplete works. The work of the apostles was, as we've already mentioned, to assess and evaluate the believers, to administer God's truth to them as nourishment for strength and stability. Now, there are some who would say, well, now, if, if any of us attempted to say some of those things, you know, well, now, you're not an apostle. But we have the writings, don't we? We have the words. What are they for? They're for this work yes, yes. of assessing and evaluating. Of course, every believer needs to do this. Every congregation needs to do this as well. Yes. I know because I know all of you. We do this. We do this of ourselves, individually, personally. We also do this of our assembly, don't we? We speak of it openly sometimes, but it happens every time we meet. I know I can see it in some of your faces, especially us veterans. We're doing this. Not for, the, not for the purpose of, of uh, uh, criticality, just being critical and picking at this and picking at that. Not at all. We don't want that. We don't want to be a part of a group like that. We don't want to be a group like that. But we do want the truth. Yeah. We don't want to play games. Right. We don't want to be Amen. what we're not. Right. We want to be what we are. That what he has made us. That's what we want to be. That's what's drawn us together. We're serious. We mean it. That's why we give these hours that we do, not just in our spring meeting, our fall meeting, and our summer meetings. <laughs> we give hours every Lord's Day, don't we? Every meeting we give hours, don't we? Because we're serious. We mean this, what we're doing. We mean it. We're not playing games. We're not taking care of a building. Yeah. The upkeep on property. Not at all. We're not keeping a budget Amen. with a report every week of how many dollars over or under we are of the budget. We're not doing that kind of thing. We're doing the work. Yeah. Put our hand to the plow. And we don't want our work to be incomplete. We're serious, serious of these things. <coughs> what God supplies for us in his word by the apostles and prophets in the spirit. That's how I like to describe it. They weren't all apostles, but they were all prophets in the spirit. Is his truth as to nourishment for strength and stability, as to instruction for training in righteousness, or correction of error in thought or deed. That's what this is for. Of course, it's primarily for building and strengthening. But we all we know we need, we need correction once in a while. We need to, especially those of us who are married, know we need correction once in a while. That's why we have our, God has granted us uh, some kind soul uh, to share our lives and uh, keep us on track and so forth. You younger ones uh, are learning that. So John is doing this very thing as well. The, the, the Savior is doing this through our brother John. And we are partaking of it still today. This is not the, this is not the first time that we've given attention to these letters, is it? All, all of us, almost every one of us have preached from some or all of these letters in our assembly. In the years that Sister Debbie and I have been meeting with you all for eight and a half years on a, on a weekly basis. Since the beginning... <laughs> On an every other week basis, we were gone for a little while. So some of us have been together for a long time. About 23 years now, isn't it? And we have, we have uh, uh, spent time in these letters again 
and again and again. And here we are again because there's a lot of truth here, important truth. And because we want the nourishment, strength, and stability that are here, that is here. Pardon me. So Jesus dictated these letters to John, personally dictated them, to personally direct this aspect of the ministry of his body, ministry to his body, this life among these believers. Brother John, we know, likely at this point, he's the final witness. It may very well be. We don't know for certain because we don't have those kinds of things recorded for us, but it may very well be he's the only one now. There are no others left. But we have this record. We have this record. So he's making uh, the Savior through Brother John is making this assessment, pardon me, of these believers in Sardis from the throne room. From the throne room. He has eyes as a flame of fire, nothing hidden from his sight. Well, of course, this was true while he was in the earth, isn't it? Or wasn't it? It was true while he was in the earth. Well, when I think of this, the first thing that I think of is when he was in that synagogue. Yeah. And he said to that brother with the withered hand, stand up. Amen. And again, here was another event where likely a lot of folks stopped breathing for a little bit. And he turned and looked at the audience and asked them that question, which is it right to do on the Sabbath? To destroy, to kill, to heal, to give life. And he looked around at all of them, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Generally speaking, the whole audience was like that. And he could see it. He could see it in Simon the Pharisee's house. When that dear woman wept on his feet and dried them with her hair, Jesus knowing what Simon thought, spoke to him Amen. again and again he did it with his disciples didn't he he did it with them things that they discussed among themselves that they tried to keep private times that they were afraid why do doubts and fears arise in your heart yeah. where is your faith he said because he knew that it was lacking in his, in his own, in his own, down, down to the night of his resurrection when he appeared there in the room and he upbraided them for their failure to believe what the sisters had said, the truth, see, assessing, evaluating. So this situation here in Sardis was not, it was not a, as they say, not a pretty sight from his perspective. And he could see the reality of it. They were playing a part, but he was not fooled, even as the scribes and the Pharisees did not fool him. Hmm. The outside of the cup is clean, the inside's full of all uncleanness. Whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. Yeah. Some things were about to die in Sardis. Ready to die. Strengthen the things which remain. Now they had to find out what those things were, didn't they? You don't want to strengthen the wrong thing. It's a waste of time. Strengthen what remained. There's something that remained that he valued and treasured. And they were. it was their job to find out what it was and give attention to it. See? And also to remember... How thou hast received. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. And hold fast and repent. And then that sober warning, if thou shalt not watch. Yeah, if thou shalt not watch. He knew the works that he was doing in his own. They are evident. The works of faith, the labors of love, the steadfastness of hope. Uh, sobriety, righteousness, godliness, the impact of the hope of the gospel for the world to come. Watching, that is, watching for the world to come. 
That, that's what he works in his people. That talk about the things to come. They're interested in the things to come. They're not so interested in the things here. Their primary attention is focused on things to come. See, watchfulness and strength, then our primary qualities, strength to these things, our primary qualities in this godly faith and hope. So, you know not the hour of my return. This is, this is the sober warning. You know not the hour of my return. The angels had said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, of course, there was no calculation about the times. In fact, he had just stated to them, just moments before, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. It's not for you to know. It's still not. It is for us to hope. To look, to watch, to be ready, to be alert. That's what it is for us. Therefore, be ye ready, the Savior stated. For when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire and taking vengeance, then there's no time to get ready. Then there's no time to correct and to remember. The time is over. All time is over then when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe that's those who are looking for him see i want to i want to be among those who are looking for him Amen. i want to be encouraged to do that myself yeah. and i want to hear about those things i know Amen. i i think you do too that's why i've, I've aligned myself with you in these things so i know you who are worthy this the closing of this letter then Precious to hear, isn't it? Yeah. I know you who are worthy. He said to Philip, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. I have a Savior say something like that about you. When they did, at this point, they didn't even know who he was, except by Philip's word. Whence knowest thou me? Before Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, we don't know all that was contained in that, but Nathaniel, he got the, he got the just of it, didn't he? Yeah. He sure did. So that's just one more example of him knowing things that men did not know. I know you who are worthy. There are some among you who have not defiled their garments. A few names. They shall walk with me in white. They are worthy. Yeah. Amen. They are worthy. Amen. I told David this morning that I, had a, I woke up having a dream. I'm not sure which one of you it was this morning. It was some couple of other brothers here that we were looking at each other and we had white hair. <laughs> I take that as a portent. <laughs> I don't know what was going on. But I actually had that dream early this morning. Why we had the, I'd like to take it that way. So, the Apostle Paul said to the believers in Thessalonica, I pray for you always. That our God would count you worthy of his calling. That God does this counting. We don't. Amen. Amen. Not even we here at the word of truth. Do this counting. He does. So we would that God would count us worthy. Amen. Worthy of his calling. Fulfill. We would that he would fulfill all his pleasure of his goodness in us. The work of faith with power. That's what we would have. That's why we have, that's why we have gathered, brethren. He, our Savior, he alone does this assessment. He's been appointed by the Father to do it. We will stand before the judgment bar of Christ. See? The believers who love these things conform themselves to them, yield themselves to this truth. We seek to be found in him blameless 
and without accusation. We yield ourselves to his power of his life to work in us. We remember what he said. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. There were, there were these few in Sardis who were. See? So we know what they were doing. We know what they had done. And they were remaining faithful and true and stable in these things. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. The Savior, the great shepherd of the sheep, knows his own. Brethren, let us then, all of us, demonstrate by our response that we hear his voice and that we will follow none other. God's grace and peace.